it's called inner product spaces. And like I said, I've already got some homework up on this, so you guys can start, can start looking at it. So intuitively, what we're talking about here, just kind of on a, on a very sort of generic level, this is just a vector space, an inner product space is just a vector space. So we're taking our vector spaces that we've already looked at and, oops, I gotta let somebody into the room here. Okay, so we take the vector spaces that we've already been looking at and we're gonna add notions of length, angle, distance, et cetera. Anything that's kind of geometry oriented. So this is kind of intuitively what we're gonna be getting after. Let me start by defining what an inner product is, okay? So I'm gonna make a definition here. This is the definition of an inner product. So as usual, I'm going to let V be any vector space. So we take any vector space we want, and inner product, you'll find this in the list of topics for this class that everybody in Math 172 is supposed to do. What is an inner product? An inner product on V assigns assigns to each pair of vectors, I'm going to call these vectors x and y in v, to each pair of vectors in v, it assigns a number. Let me really emphasize that. It has to be a number. And the way it's written, we put this x and y vector. Be sure to put arrows on top of these vectors here. These are not really to be thought of as slots. This is not R2. This is a notation that represents a number that is associated with any two vectors. And how is this number defined? Well, there are some rules. So such that, let me write down the rules here. There are actually four of them. You can think of these as axioms. Just like we have the vector space axioms, well, we also have the inner product space axioms. So in addition to a vector space, which already has 10 axioms, I'm about to give you four more for an inner product. So here they are. The first one is that if you take the inner product of a vector with itself, the first requirement is that the number that you get here, this number must be at least zero. So it cannot be negative. It has to be at least zero and it equals zero, the only way it equals zero, only if, that only happens if x itself is the zero vector. Okay, so this is if you take the inner product of a vector with itself. Incidentally, guys, none of this will be on Thursday's quiz. It will be on the next test, though, so it's never too early to start, to start getting a handle on it. The second axiom says that the inner product of x with y is always the same as the inner product of y with x. So the order in which you compute the inner product of two vectors, it makes no difference, okay? Thirdly, if we take a constant c and we multiply it inside the inner product notation by x, and then take the inner product of that with y, well, we have to be able to pull the c out. So it's just simply going to be c times the inner product of x with y. And finally, I said there were four axioms. The last one just says that if we add two vectors, let's say x1 and x2, and take the inner product of that one with y, this should be the same as the inner product of x1 with y plus 
the inner product of x2 with y. Okay, so in other words, this inner product, the, the, you might notice the third and the fourth axioms have to do with scalar multiplication and addition which are the two operations in the vector space to begin with, right? So we have addition and scalar multiplication. The inner product should respect those operations. We should be able to factor constants out. We should be able to split up plus signs exactly as I've, as I've written right here, okay? Please put these notes, uh, these four axioms somewhere that you can look at. I'm gonna have to erase them, obviously, on this small board that I have to work with. But put them somewhere where you can refer to them as we go through these next, <coughs> excuse me, these next several minutes. Okay? <coughs> excuse me. Sorry. Oh, you got it. Okay, so if we have a vector space equipped with an inner product, we call it an inner product space. Okay? So um, I should write that down as well. Definition. A vector space equipped with an inner product a vector space equipped with an inner product is called this is called an inner product space. Okay? And so I'll put an underlining on that. So when you think about an inner product space, you're just thinking of a vector space that has an inner product on it. Now somehow there has to be a geometry relationship that I haven't talked about yet. Once I have this inner product, I'm supposed to have notions of angles and lengths and distances and directions and all that stuff. But I, I'm not quite ready to get into that yet. Before I do that, I want to give you at least a couple of examples of inner products. So you actually have something that you can look at, okay? So let me, uh, let me write down some examples. I'm gonna erase these four rules, but please keep them handy on your notes so that we can be easily referring to them. Questions so far? So far, so good. Okay, super. Hearing nothing, I will do an example. So here's an example. Let's suppose that we take the vector space Rn. Okay, I'm going to start with something that's pretty, pretty well known. And I'm going to define the inner product of one vector a1, a2, dot, 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 up to a n with another vector b1, b2, dot, 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 up to b n. I'm going to define this to be a1, b1, plus a2, b2, plus dot, 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 plus a n, b n. So, what you're basically doing is multiplying the corresponding slots with one another and then adding the results. So, um, for example, uh, so in the case, in the case where n is equal to three, this is the so-called, this is what is the, the usual sort of dot product. Is everybody familiar with taking a dot product of vectors? Have you guys seen that before? See, I don't quite know for sure. If you, maybe you don't know this. If you didn't take like a multivariable calculus class, uh, you might not have seen this. It's, it's nothing difficult. Like for example, if I wanna just take, you know, if I just wanna take something like, I don't know, one, four, negative three, and I wanna take the inner product of that with the vector seven, negative one, 
negative two, right? We can do this calculation. We can do this calculation. We just take the first slot. So one times seven plus four times negative one plus negative three times negative two. So this would be seven minus four plus six, which should come out to nine. Okay, and remember when we calculate the inner product of two vectors, we get a number like we did right here. Okay, now I wrote down this definition of this inner product up here, but technically I need to verify those four axioms. You're gonna be doing that in the homework that you're gonna work on for uh, Friday. There's gonna be a few examples where they want you to actually verify the axioms of an inner product space, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. Are there any questions here? Does everybody see what I'm, so basically you take two vectors in Rn and when you form their inner product, you get this number right over here, okay? Let me go ahead and erase uh, this example here. Let's just check these axioms. By the way, the axiom that often doesn't hold is the first one. So I like to put that one first in my list. So let's just check this. Let's check the axioms. The first axiom is the one where we take the inner product of a vector with itself, right? So that's going to be, I'm just going to write it like this, a1, a2, dot, 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 a n, inner product with itself again, a1, a2, dot, 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 up to a n. And what I'm looking for here is that this needs to be greater than or equal to zero. That's that first axiom, right? When you take the inner product of a vector with itself, the result should be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so um, in this case, how, what am I gonna get? Well, everywhere that I see the Bs over here in this formula, they're just gonna be As again, because I'm putting the same vector in both places here. So this just becomes A1 squared plus A2 squared plus dot, 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 plus a n squared. And I think everybody would agree that if you add up a bunch of numbers that are squared, it's definitely at least zero. I'm gonna put a little check mark there. It's definitely at least zero. And the only way that this could equal zero, I'll just put this down here, equals zero only if, the only way that these numbers can add up to zero is if, the vector a1 dot 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 up to a n is equal to the zero vector. In other words, all of those a's have to be zero. Okay? So this is checking the first axiom. When you take the inner product of a vector with itself, you're supposed to always get an answer that's at least zero. You're not allowed to have a negative. And you can only get zero if you were looking at the zero vector in the first place. The zero vector for Rn is obviously just the vector where all of the entries are zero. Okay, let's look at the second axiom. The second axiom is the one that says that the inner product of the first vector with the second vector should equal the inner product of the second vector with the first vector. So let me write that, let me, let me see if I can justify that. And again, you're gonna to wanna to write these notes down because you're gonna be asked to do something very similar in the homework that you're gonna be doing for Friday. So here's the inner product of two vectors. And of course we have the formula. We have the formula, it's A1B1 plus A2B2 plus dot, dot, dot plus a n b n, like that. That's from the definition. And my goal, my goal is to get the b vector in front of the a vector. So what do you suppose I might wanna do with this expression here to start getting the b vector on the left and the a vector on the right? 
factor out the bees? Factor them out and do what with them? They're already kind of factored out. True. What do I want to actually do though? Just to clarify that. So these bees, they're not the same, right? B1, B2, B3, these are just different numbers. So I can't really just like pull one B out as a factor, but what do I want to do with this expression? To get the Bs on the, to get the B vector on the left and the A vector on the right, what, what would I be allowed to do? Remember, these are just numbers. A1, B1, A2, B2, they're all just numbers. What am I allowed to do with those numbers? Can you use the commutative property? Yeah, I can just use the fact that A1 times B1 is the same as B1 times A1. Let's put the Bs in front, right? And then I'm going to do the same thing on the second term. B2, A2, dot, 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 B, N, A, N. Just like that. And now that is exactly what we wanted. It's just the, the B vector right here. Inner product that with the A vector. Okay, so we can get the B's in front of the A's. So this is really like X and Y. The inner product of X with Y is the same as the inner product of Y with X. Right, that's the idea of what we're doing there. That's the second axiom. Let me go on to the third axiom. For the third axiom, I have to take a constant times a vector, a1, a2, dot, 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 up to a n, and I'm going to take the inner product of that with b1, b2, dot, 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 b n. This is the axiom where we want to factor the constant out, okay? But before I can factor it out, before I can factor this, I can't just pull the C out without thinking about it, right? That would not be a good idea. What we can do though, is I can, I can multiply the C into the first vector at CA1, CA2, up to CAN, comma, and then B1, I'm running out of room here. I'm just going to do dot, 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 up to BN in that second slot. So in other words, I'm just multiplying the constant through the first vector here. And now I have a vector and a vector. I can use my formula to write out the answer, right? What it comes out to is, you know, CA1, B1, plus CA2, B2, dot, 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 plus CAN, BN. So now that's the step where I actually used the formula that was given here in this example. The formula just says multiply the corresponding slots together and add, add them up. What do you suppose I'm going to want to do with this, uh, this expression here on the second line? Factor at the C. That's right, we're gonna take out a C, very good. So we just factor out the C here, it leaves me with A1, B1, plus dot, 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 plus A, N, B, N. That's just kind of a knee-jerk reaction. You see that common factor of C everywhere, you just naturally wanna pull it out. And then what you have at that point, what you have at that point is, you have the C out in front, so this is just C, times the inner product of a1 dot 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 up to an with b1 dot 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 up to bn. Okay, so that's axiom three. It's the axiom that you can pull constants out. Okay, so the inner product respects scalar multiplication basically. And then there's a fourth axiom. The fourth axiom is kind of a mess to write out. I'm gonna go ahead and give myself more room here. So 
So the fourth axiom says that if I add two vectors together, so a1, a2, dot, 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 up to a n, plus I need another vector, let me call it x1, x2, dot, 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 up to xn, comma, b1, b2, dot, 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 up to bn. If I have this expression, I should be able to split it apart into two separate inner product expressions, right? The inner product of the a vector with b, plus the inner product of the bx vector with b. Let's try it, okay? So the first step, the first step here is to just do the addition in this first slot, right? I'm just gonna take this first slot, I'm just gonna add together a1 plus x1, a2 plus x2, dot, 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 a n plus x n, inner product of b1, b2, etc. So we just leave the right hand term the same, but I'm just literally just adding the vectors slot by slot right there. Why, is, why did I do that? Well, I wanna make a single vector here. This is a single vector being inner producted with another single vector. And now we use our formula. The formula says, you know, take the individual components and multiply them together slot by slot. So we'll get a1 plus x1 times b1 plus a2 plus x2 times b2 plus dot 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 plus a n plus x n times b n. Just like that. And does somebody have a suggestion what I might want to do next? By the way, this, this whole thing is just one big giant number. Yeah, sorry, Kurt? Uh, just multiply the B1 out to each A1, or AN and XN. Yeah, we may as well just distribute this thing out, and I'm gonna put all of the A and B parts kind of together. So I'm gonna write this as, you know, I'm gonna do the A1, B1 first, and then I'm gonna do A2, B2, and I'm gonna go dot, 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 and the last one is A, N, Bn, right? I'm going to do all of the a, a times B combinations, and then I'm going to come back and do all of the X B combinations. So X1 B1 plus X2 B2 plus dot 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 plus Xn Bn. So I kind of need to break it down like that. And you'll recognize the first expression. The first expression is just, as you saw from the definition that I gave, the inner product of the A vector, A1 through AN, with the B vector, B1 through BN, and then plus, the, in, the second term is the inner product of the X vector, X1, X2, dot, 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 up to XN, with B1, B2, dot, 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 B, N. Just like that. And that's what we needed to show for the fourth axiom. It's a little tedious. I'm not going to lie, right? This is a little tedious, but the good thing is we just did it once and we never have to do it again for this example, right? If we ever want to work with R, N, and we ever want to use the inner product formula that I gave on this example, we are always allowed to use it because we've checked once and for all those four axioms. Okay? Let me, and I know this is not the exciting part, okay? <laughs> the, the geometry is, is obviously going to be the more interesting part, I think, but I do want people to understand what is an inner product and how do you verify it. I want to write down one more example of an inner product, unless there's a question so far on what's up here. Okay, let me do one more example of a very different nature. So here's an example. 
This time I'm going to take my vector space to be C of AB. I don't know if you remember this one very well. This is just the one that consists of like calculus functions. These are just the, the vector space of functions with addition and scalar multiplication. And I'm now going to equip this vector space with a proposal for an inner product. Here it is. Define the inner product of f with g. <coughs> Just, I'm sorry, I need to ask one more question. You got, have you guys all had calculus, like one semester even? Yeah. Like that's, that's something everybody's seen, I think. It's like a prerequisite for this. I hope, I've done three, I hope you, Calc 2, just not Calc, calc 2, 3. Yeah. All I want to know is if you've seen Calc 1. If you've ever seen an integral. <laughs> because that's what I'm going to put right here. The integral from A to B of F of X times G of X dx. If anybody's lost on what I'm... Uh, talking about right now, uh, let me know. But this is just an integral from A to B of F times G. Now, the, when you do this kind of an integral, as you guys know, you get a number. You get a number because this is like, what, the area under the curve between A and B, it's like a numerical value. I claim that this is a valid inner product. And the first one that we did a minute ago, is probably the world's most famous example of an inner product. And this one is probably the second most famous. So these are, I'm showing you the two most, most often used inner products that the world has ever known. <laughs> okay, so let me um, talk about the axioms again. And this will just, uh, this will just require a very, very basic knowledge of properties of integrals. It's really not, not that hard. So let's just check the axioms. So the first one, again, so I'm just going to run through. The first one is where we take the inner product of a vector with itself. So we have some function here. This could be, you know, sine of x times sine of x, right? It could be, the, it's just the same function. This is just the integral from A to B of f of x times itself. In other words, it's f of x squared. Well, when you take f of x and you square it, you are making a function that is positive. This would be a function that is graphed above the x-axis. And the area under the curve, if the function is above the x-axis, this has to be at least zero. Okay. And I'm going to add that second part of this axiom into, into the parentheses here. It equals zero only if f of x is itself zero. So the only way we can actually get zero out of this integral would be if the function itself was just literally equal to zero. So this is the first axiom. This is all we have to write down. The rest of these axioms are also pretty easy. So like if I want to do the inner product of f with g, I would like to switch the f and the g here. So this is the integral from a to b of f of x, g of x, dx, according to the formula. But what can I do right now inside that integrand? What do I want to do? Commuter properties, you can like swap them? That's right. I want to switch the uh, f and the g using the commutative property for functions, right? Functions can be multiplied whatever order we want. It doesn't change the result. So let's just rewrite this one as integral of g of x, f of x, dx. And that then becomes the inner product with, of G with F. Okay, so that's all you have to do to switch the positions of the F and the G on the inside. The third axiom 
just running through the axioms, a constant times f inner product with g. What we want to do here is try to pull that constant out in front. So this is the integral from a to b of c times f of x g of x dx. And does anybody know a, a property of integrals that might be useful right now? You can, you can take out constants. Exactly right, guys. We can take constants out in front. So I'm just going to factor this c right outside the integral. And we have the integral of f of x g of x dx. And so that is c times the inner product of f of g. Excellent. Okay, and then finally, the last one, the fourth one here, we have, let's say, two functions. I'm going to call them f1 and f2. That would be a good set of names for the, for the two functions. We're going to add f1 and f2. We're going to add two vectors together in the first position, an inner product with the second vector here. So this becomes the integral from a to b of f1 of x plus, whoops, f1 of x plus f2 of x. That's all times g of x dx equals, well, I imagine that you know what I'm going to do next with this. Just distribute the g of x. And then got it. That, that's exactly right. I'm going, to, I'm going to distribute the g of x. So I have the integral of f1 of x times g of x plus f2 of x times g of x, just multiplying it out. And this is two things added together. And this is another thing that we can do with integrals, which is we can split them apart and calculate them individually, right? So this will be the integral from a to b of f1 of x times g of x dx plus the integral from a to b of f2 of x g of x dx. And that is exactly what we want. The inner product of f1 with g plus the inner product of f2 with g. Okay. Does this make sense? So we've actually done two full examples of checking all four axioms that they, that they actually work. Let me give you an example, one more example, that's similar to this one, okay? So here's an example. Again, I'm going to use the same vector space, C of, actually, let me be more specific here. I'm sorry. I'm going to use the, uh, the interval from negative 1 to 0, specifically that interval. And I'm going to define, I'm going to define the inner product of f with g again to be the integral from minus 1 to 0 of x times f of x times g of x dx. And this time I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to ask, is this a valid inner product on V? So I'm going to phrase this one as a question this time. Well, it's not, it always, it's not always positive, right? Yeah, you're, you're already thinking to, about that first axiom. So remember that when you take the inner product of a vector with itself, you cannot get a negative answer. Now, depending on what your function is that you're plugging into that, you might get a positive answer, but it's also possible to get a negative answer. If you can find even one example, right? So when the answer is no, 
we were talking about this with vector spaces too, right? When something fails, I just need one example to show that. And in fact, as I mentioned, it is often axiom one that fails. So Michael's on the right track here already with this, that this can somebody think of a specific function f of x that I could use right now? Um, so I want to I want to actually do a specific calculation. <coughs> somebody give me a function, a very very easy function. Anything you like. f of x equals x something squared? that's easy to. Give me something that's easy to integrate. What can you think of? X squared. X squared, very good. Let's do that. Let's take X squared with itself. And let's just see what we get, right? If we do this calculation, we're going to integrate from negative one to zero of X times X squared times X squared, which is actually X to the fifth, right? We're just going to integrate x to the fifth right here. And of course, this gives us one sixth of x to the sixth. And we evaluate that from zero to one, I'm sorry, from negative one to zero, and we get negative one sixth, which is less than zero. So if we get a negative answer when we take the inner product of a vector with itself, then the axiom is going to, this first axiom will fail. Of course, this isn't the only polynomial. Anything you would have given me pretty much would have worked. Do I have to look at the other axioms? No. I don't think so either, right? Because once you know that um, one of the axioms fails, it's game over. Right? It's not an inner product, so we can stop. We, we already know that, that it isn't going to work. Okay? Excellent. So are there any questions on sort of the definition of an inner product? These axioms that we've just been talking about, are people comfortable with it? Okay, let me erase uh, up here at the top. Oh, you know what? I'm going to do one more. <laughs> and by the way, I think I'm probably, I think this one might even be on the homework. Uh, and maybe the next one will too. I'm going to do one more example, okay? And the reason I'm doing this is because this is actually the hard part. Most people have more trouble with just checking the axioms and, and understanding the definition of an inner product. Once we get past the definition, then we get to start having fun and doing the geometry and all of that. That part is actually much more just sort of direct calculations. So that part will be easier and we'll get to that in just a minute. But I'm gonna do one more example. I'm, I'm just gonna make this fast. Let's take the vector space to be M2 of R. So let's go back to this example of a vector space and I'm going to define the inner product of the matrix A1, A2, A3, A4 with the matrix B1, B2, B3, B4. I'm going to define that to be A1, B1. And I'm going to ask again, is this a valid inner product on V. We'll see if we can answer this one. <laughs> Is this valid? The first axiom, remember, requires that when I take an inner product of a vector with it itself, I always have to get a number that's at least zero, and it can only be zero if I'm using the zero vector. So using this formula is the key to thinking about this. If I, I think, put this- I think it is. 
if I, if I put the same matrix in both positions, then I will get A1 squared over here, right? Well, A1 squared is definitely a, at least zero. Okay, now another question though, still on axiom one, if this is equal to zero, does that mean that my vector that I was taking the inner product with itself had to be zero? Let me just remind you, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna write the axiom down again really quickly. This one is a little tricky, okay? So axiom one, I just wanna make sure, it's in the notes, but I just wanna have it here. The inner product of a vector with itself is at least zero, and it equals zero only if the vector was the zero vector. That fails because you could have A1 equal to zero, but all the other ones equal to something else. That's right. I can choose a matrix that's not the zero matrix that still gives me zero over here. For instance, I could take, so this is going to be no, axiom one fails. I could take, for example, the matrix zero, one, two, three, right? If you take the inner product of that matrix with itself, this is not the zero vector, right? This is not the zero vector, but when I do the formula, when I use the formula that was given, well, I actually get zero. So this violates the part in parentheses here. This inner product can only be equal to zero for the zero vector itself. And here we have an example where we have a non-zero vector whose inner product with itself was actually zero. Okay, so again, axiom one. Both of these last two examples, it's not an inner product. The first axiom fails and we can stop. Questions? Okay. Uh, there are a couple of other things I wanted to mention, and then I'm going to make a few definitions to kind of get the geometry part of this going. So just a couple of little facts here. Uh, first of all, you remember on that, on that third axiom, you might remember on the third axiom, the constant was in the left position. It was like multiplying the x vector. So you might wonder, well, what am I going to do if there's a constant multiple in the second slot? Well, it turns out we can still factor out the C because of the following. I can use axiom two to switch the order. So I can put the, the CY first and then the X. And then I can go from there to pull out the constant. And that's by axiom three. And then I can switch the, the Y and the X back to how they were in the first place. And that's again by axiom two. So using the axioms, Using the axioms, I can pull a constant out of both slots. I can pull it out of the second slot as well. That's still true. And as you, I'm sure you won't be surprised that I can also do that with, with the uh, addition in the second slot. So if I have something like this, where I have y1 plus y2 in the second position, I can do exactly the same thing where I use axiom two, that's the one that switches the two slots, right? I can switch the two slots around. I can do that first. Once the two slots are switched, I can pull it apart using axiom four, right? So now I can go ahead and use axiom four. This is just good practice with the axioms. The inner product of y1 with x 
plus the inner product of y2 with x, we can just break that up using the fourth axiom. And then, of course, we can go back. Hopefully, I'm not going too fast here. I can go back to axiom two and switch everything back around again. If I have enough room. Barely can squeeze that in there. But I just switched these two back around the way they started. So, so the fact that the scalar multiplication and the addition are um, respected by inner products in the first slot is also true in the second slots as well. So these are not axioms. These are things that we are, that we are deriving from those four axioms. Okay. Corollaries, perhaps? Yeah, you could think of them as, exactly. These are like corollaries from those axioms. They follow pretty much directly from the axioms. Very good, yeah, that's right. Okay, so let me, um, I know we've been going for a little while here, but before we take a break, let me get a few definitions that are more geometry oriented onto the board so that we can um, start to see where this stuff really gets used. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some geometry. We're gonna see the applications a little bit. So as a definition, Call this first thing a definition here. The length, the length, or it is sometimes called the norm, or it's also sometimes called the magnitude. So three different words for the same thing here. So the length, or the norm, or the magnitude of a vector v, right? It is given by, I'm going to use these double absolute value bars here. They're not really absolute value bars, but it's just a norm notation. And the formula is that we take the square root of the inner product of V with itself. This is just a definition. Mathematicians can, like, we can make... We can define whatever we want, right? <laughs> the question will be if it's worth, it's a, if it's of any use or not. The first axiom guarantees that what's under that radical will not be negative, right? So if we have an inner product, we cannot be taking the, the square root of a negative number because what's under that radical has to be positive or at least zero. So that's a safe thing to do. Um, and then a related definition here is, uh, the concept of a unit vector. So let me write this down. We'll do an example in just a second. But one more quick definition. If the norm of a vector is equal to 1, it happens to have a length of 1, then we call V a unit vector. A unit vector has a length of exactly one. Okay, so um, just as a, a quick example, uh, let's just use R3 and we'll just use the, the, okay, so guys, I have to tell you what inner product I'm going to use for you to be, able to, do a, to be able to do a problem, right? So if I'm just gonna, if I just write down R3, you don't know what I'm talking about as far as, you know, the inner product and how to, how to make, you know, equate, how to apply formulas like this. So I have to give you this formula, which I'm gonna do right here. A1, A2, A3, inner product with B1, B2, B3, and this is A1, B1 plus A2, B2, plus A3, B3. Incidentally, this particular inner product, this is the one we already looked at. The very first example I wrote down, it's just basically a regular dot product, if you, if, for those of you who do know what that is. This is actually called the standard inner product. 
And that's just because it is so familiar and it's so commonly used that, you know, we just want to have a, a sort of set it apart from all of the other possible inner products that we could put or that we could define on R3. So this is just a standard inner product. When you're doing the homework for Friday, if you come across a question where they don't tell you what the inner product formula is, you should assume that it is the standard inner product because otherwise they have to tell you. They have to tell you um, what, inner, what formula to use to take the inner product between two vectors. They gotta give that to you. Otherwise you don't have the equipment that you need to do all these calculations of norms and unit vectors and everything else we're gonna go into. So this has to be sort of spelled out. So just to practice here for a second, if I wanted to take the norm of, I just made up a vector here, two, negative five, three, Using this standard inner product with this definition, let me put a box on this one because it's kind of important. We're just going to take the square root of the inner product of 2, negative 5, 3 with itself. Okay? So underneath the radical, we're just going to do an inner product of the vector with itself. So that if we work this out, well, this is the square root of 2 times 2, which is 4, plus negative 5 times negative 5, which is 25, plus 3 times 3, which is 9. And so the answer comes out to the square root of 38. Okay? And that would be a perfectly good answer. In general, So in general, of course, if I want to know the length, I'm going to try to squeeze this right here at the bottom. I hope this will fit. If I want to know the length of any vector a, b, c, well, it's just going to be the square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Okay. Um, so that is just the use of the norm formula, the magnitude formula. Now, what we will sometimes want to do, we will sometimes want to take a vector like this. So this is just a vector, right? It actually could be drawn as an arrow that's pointing in the direction of the vector 2, negative 5, 3. And the length of that vector is the square root of 38. We will sometimes want to actually make our vector into a unit vector. So we will sometimes actually want to, you know, shrink it down without changing its direction, but just shrink it down in order to become a unit vector. And there's a way to do that. And I want to make sure that I show that to you really quickly here. So just as a quick remark, if we take the norm of a multiple of a vector, take a look at this. This is the inner product of the vector CV with CV. Okay? And we learned a few minutes ago with the, with the inner product axioms, I can pull this C out in front and this C can also come out in front because of that uh, remark, those two facts that we showed. So you actually have two factors of C that you can pull out of the inner product of B with itself. And of course, the square root of C squared is the absolute value of C times what you're left with is the norm of B. Okay, so when you're looking at the length of a multiple of a vector, you can just take that multiple right out. You, may, you have to make it positive. That's what the absolute value bar has accomplished. But essentially, there's nothing surprising about this remark at all. You're just taking the constant out in front of the length of the vector itself. And so using that, 
Then I can make one more remark. So one more remark here then would be this. If V is not zero, then if I make a vector U, which is one over the norm of V, scalar multiplied on V, this is a unit vector. This actually becomes a unit vector. That's why I'm calling it U. Remember a unit vector? It, I just defined it a couple minutes ago. A unit vector has length one. Let's check that. Let me actually just verify that right here. I'm gonna take the length of u, right? So the length of u is just the length of one over the norm of v times v. And one over the norm of v is just like a constant. Right? It's just my C. This is just a number, scalar multiplying my vector. So the formula, the first remark tells me that I can pull that constant out. It's actually already positive, so I don't need the absolute value bars on it. And then I just multiply by the norm of the vector itself, and sure enough, it just cancels out to one. So you can take any vector and turn it into a unit vector, right? It's not that hard to do. So for example, for example, if I just take one over the square root of 38 times the vector two, negative five, three, that is a unit vector. in R3. That's a unit vector in R3 because we just take the vector and scalar multiply it by one over its length, which we had found earlier in that last example. This is called normalization. We're normalizing a vector by shrinking it down so that it has a, a length of one. <coughs> okay. Um, Let me do one more definition, I guess, yeah, let me do one more thing, it's really fast, and then we'll take a break, okay? I just wanna define the angle between two vectors. It's the last thing I'm gonna do before we take a break, so let me do that down here, and then maybe we'll do one quick example of it as well. So a quick little definition, and I'm sorry there's so many definitions tonight, there's a lot of material here, there's no question about it. Um, the angle, the angle between the vectors V and W is defined by, so we now know how to find the length of a vector, but now let's talk about the angle between two vectors. And here is the formula. <laughs> it's actually going to be defined in terms of the cosine of the angle. So theta, sorry, the angle here is theta. So the angle theta between two vectors is given by this cosine formula, which goes like this. It's a fraction. And on top, we're going to put the inner product of V with W. And then on the bottom, I'm going to put the norm of V times the norm of W. Okay. So we can define the angle between two vectors as the cosine of the angle has to be equal to this fraction. If you've never seen the dot product before, this is maybe a little bit of a out of the blue definition. The reason we define this angle like this 
is because if we use the sort of the usual dot product in R2 or R3, you can actually prove using trigonometry that the cosine of the angle between any two vectors is exactly this fraction. You simply take the inner product of the two vectors, which is the regular dot product in that case, and divide by the lengths of those vectors. So we're taking a formula that is actually very familiar for R3, just kind of a, in the standard dot product world of R3, and we're saying, you know what? We like that formula so much that we're gonna use that same formula to define the angle between any two vectors in any inner product space whatsoever. And so now these vectors could be matrices, they could be polynomials, they could be functions, really could be anything. And so uh, that is basically where, the, where this definition comes from. Um, let me see. Um, well, let me just do one quick example of this, okay? <coughs> so, and then we'll take a break. So example, <coughs> in the vector space C of zero one, with the inner, I have to tell you the inner product. So the inner product of two functions is just going to be the integral from zero to one of f of x, g of x, dx. So see, I have to tell you that. I have to give that to you. What is the angle? What is the angle between f of x equals x and g of x equals x squared plus one? Okay, so we can try to find the angle between these two vectors. It's just a, a chance to practice the formula that I've got down here on the bottom of the board. This formula in the box at the bottom, right? So for the solution, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look, the cosine of theta is equal to the inner product of f with g divided by the norm of f times the norm of g. Okay? And now let me do some calculations here. So that's just the formula. Let's do some calculations using this formula. So the, what is the inner product of x with x squared plus one. This is the numerator, right? This is the numerator of my cosine fraction here, right? So I have to do this inner product. Well, I've got the inner product formula right there. It's the integral from zero to one of these two things multiplied together. Okay, so I just put those inside the integral like that. In order to evaluate that integral, I'm just going to multiply this out. So I would get x squared plus x. That's the easiest way to get the answer here. And this becomes 1 fourth x to the fourth plus 1 half x squared, which I have to evaluate from 0 to 1. And I'm going to end up getting 3 fourths. When I put in x equals one, I get one fourth plus one half, which is three fourths. And when I put in zero on the bottom, I don't get anything. Okay. And what is the length of x itself? We need to know this, this value as well. So this one is the square root of the inner product of x with itself, which is actually just the integral from zero to one of x squared dx. So that's going to come out to be the square root of one third. Okay. This is what I meant earlier when I said it all gets very computational. <laughs> right. Uh, and 
Finally, we also need the length of x squared plus 1, which would be the square root of the integral from 0 to 1 of this x squared plus 1 times itself, which would be, actually, if you multiply that by itself, it's x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus 1, all under that radical. I need a little bit more room, don't I? back up to the top here. So this is going to be equal to the square root of, I'm just going to go right to the answer, guys, if that's okay. Uh, I just have to integrate x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus 1. So the integral of x to the fourth is going to evaluate to 1 fifth. The integral of 2x squared is going to evaluate to 2 thirds. And the integral of 1 when I integrate it, it'll add up to 1. And this can be reduced, can't it? This is going to be the square root of, I can make a denominator of 15. And let's see. I think that's the square root of 28 over 15, if I do my fractions correctly. So I make a common denominator of 15, and I'll get 3, 5, I'm sorry, 3, 10, and 15, which is which is 28, yeah. Okay, so, and so the cosine of the angle, we just now put in all the numbers. We had three fourths on top over the square root of 28 over 15 and the square root of one over three, like that. And this could be simplified I mean, you could actually uh, make some a common, uh, you could pull out some common factors there, but I'm just going to leave it like that. I don't really care. You would need to get out a calculator now to actually evaluate theta. Uh, make sure you would, make sure you do that in radians when you're finding the uh, inverse cosine, I guess it would be, of the uh, number here on the right side. So you can go home tonight and tell your friends that you're finding angles between functions. <laughs> and then you can see if they're still your friends. <laughs> um, they might think you're a little weird. Just blame it on me. Um, <laughs> my math professor wants to start finding angles between functions. I don't know why. <laughs> Actually, this is really important stuff. It gets used a lot for a lot of reasons. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth doing, especially this particular inner product that you see right here, it's used very, very commonly. So, well, we'll have some more things to say about it, but I would like to take a break for 10 minutes right now. Uh, I know I've been talking a long time. Uh, the second half of our class will obviously be much shorter. Uh, during the second half of our class, I would like uh, to answer some homework questions. I'm going to have us work on a group work together, and I'm going to just do a quick little recap of some of the stuff from late last week that um, I just want to put back on your radar as you're studying for the quiz. The stuff we've just done for the last hour and 15 minutes will not be on the quiz. This is the start of a new topic altogether. Um, this will be for your next homework assignment for Friday, but not for the quiz. So let's take a break until, oh, let's take 10 minutes. So let's take until about 6.03 or so, and uh, then I'll be right back here and be ready to answer some questions on the homework.